Hello, I'm Reverend Ruth Van Lillian. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of the Emerald Coast. We are a covenantal community founded on loving kindness and a common devotion to our free faith. We recognize all the earth as sacred ground and we welcome each other into this virtual space. We especially welcome those visiting with us today. We are so glad you are here. We invite you to check our website and Facebook page to learn more about us. We hope to touch hearts, teach minds, challenge spirits, and comfort souls. May you find refreshment and restoration in our service today. We receive fragments of holiness by Sarah York. We receive fragments of holiness, glimpses of eternity, brief moments of insight. Let us gather them up for the precious gifts that they are and renewed by their grace, move boldly into the unknown. Hello, I'm Amanda, and my story for all ages today is called What Do You Do With a Chance by Kobe Yamada, illustrated by Mae Besom, 
may look a little familiar. We've read others of his books before. I chose it because, you know, as a kid, we often think the grown-ups have all the answers. They know how everything works. Or maybe as a teenager, you think they don't have any of the answers. And I know that even at my age, I look around and go, mm, those are the grown-ups. They know how to do things. <laughs> Not me. And maybe we all feel that way deep down, that we always have things to learn, ways to grow, and that's just the way it is. So this book, even though there's a kid as the protagonist here, the main character, it really applies to all of us. So there we go. One day, I got a chance. I like the way the author drew it like it was a a golden paper airplane. It just seemed to show up. It acted like it knew me, as if it wanted something. I didn't know why it was here. What do you do with a chance, I wondered. It fluttered around me. It brushed up against me. It circled me as if it wanted me to grab it. I started to reach for it, but I was unsure and pulled back. So it flew away. I thought about it a lot. I wished I had taken my chance. I realized I had wanted it, but I still didn't know if I had the courage. No matter what your age, we're not always sure what we should do next. When another chance came around, I wasn't so sure, but I decided to try. Looks really hard to catch. I went to reach for it, but I missed and fell. I was embarrassed. I felt foolish. It seemed like everyone was looking at me. I bet you know the feeling. I decided I never wanted to feel this way again. It is pretty awful when you try something and you don't succeed. So after that, whenever a chance came along, I ignored it. Just pretended it wasn't there. The more I ignored them, the less they came around. Until one day I noticed that I hadn't seen a chance in quite a while. It was as if they had all disappeared. I started to worry. What if I don't get another chance? I know I acted like I didn't care, but the truth was, I did. I still wanted to take a chance, but I was afraid. And I wasn't sure is if I would ever be brave enough. There just aren't any chances around. Maybe I've just lost my chance forever. Then I thought, maybe I don't have to be brave all the time. Maybe I just need to be brave for a little while at the right time. I realized it was up to me. Pretty good advice, huh? You don't have to be brave all the time, just a little bit at the right time. I promised myself if I ever got another chance, I wasn't gonna hold back. If I got another chance, I was going to be ready. He's got his staff. He's got his superhero outfit and friends nearby. Then, one seemingly ordinary day, I saw something shining off in the distance. Is it possible? I hoped. Could this be my chance? It's really far away. I had to find out. I ran as hard and as fast as I could toward it. I don't know how to explain it, but the second I let go of my fears, I was full of excitement. It's an adventure. It wasn't that I was no longer afraid, but now my excitement was bigger than my fear. As I got closer, I could see this was a really Huge chance. But this time, I was ready. 
As it came by, I reached out and grabbed it. I held on with all my might. Oh, it is flying off with him. It felt so good to soar, to fly, to be free. I now see that when I hold back, I miss out. And I don't want to miss out. There's just so much I want to see and do and discover. So, what do you do with a chance? You take it because it just might be the start of something incredible. And that's the end. <laughs> Here comes a chance. You might not see those chances. They're not always golden paper airplanes flying toward you. They're not always that obvious. But still, if it's a chance to learn and grow or do something new or just stretch yourself even a little bit, no matter how old you are, still a good idea. Thanks for listening. Bye.
Our fellowship and our community need our financial support. If you're a member or friend, old or new, you can send in your pledge or other contribution by check or online at uufec.com. We also have a tradition that we call Share the Plate. When we're in person at church, the collection plate offering is split between the fellowship and the local charity. During these times of COVID, we're doing the same thing with online donations. They will be split between the fellowship and for February, a new charity that we're supporting called Youth Village of Fort Walton Beach. Youth Village is a nonprofit childcare center for children ages three to 14. They also provide preschool for ages three to five, a before and after school program for kids in kindergarten through eighth grade and a summer program. They strive to help children acquire a love of learning. Thank you for your generosity. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are. A few days after he graduated in, 19, in uh, 2019, I asked my son Liam how he felt to be done with high school. He responded, well, I don't really feel grown up. I don't even know how to make coffee. I smiled at him and said, that's okay, baby. You don't drink coffee. <laughs> we are alive until we die. We grow until we stop. Now think back. Think back to when you were a child, younger than 10. What did you want to be when you grew up? <laughs> there you go. I loved rocks. I tore all my pockets, bringing home rocks from the schoolyard. At age seven, I decided I would be a geologist. Now, not so long ago in our country's history, people, mostly men, chose or ended up in a job that would be theirs their whole lives 40 or more years then came retirement though fewer lived long enough to enjoy a long retirement some of you may have been in the same occupation or the same kind of occupation for many years others start in one occupation and then move around to try other things or lose one job and find themselves in a different and unexpected work environment. Some return to school, midlife, to start over with an entirely different career. Some of you have already been what you were going to be when you grew up, right? You got the education and the training and you did the work, you paid your dues, you made your way along, now you're done. Now you're retired. Do you feel all grown up now? What happens next? I knew a lovely man out in Colorado who had been a professor of music and a church organist for 40 years when he retired at 65. And then he decided to learn about handbells and he led bell choirs and wrote and published handbell music for another 20 years. He could not stop pursuing his personal call of the what do you want to be. He couldn't stop being a musician. His retirement became a space for new growth and discoveries. We are alive until we die. We grow until we stop. We are our grandmother's prayers, and we are our grandfather's dreamings. We are the breath of our ancestors. We are the spirit of God. I fulfilled my career goal at the age of 25. I'm not saying I made my fortune, very few ministers make fortunes, 
But I felt a call to parish ministry when I was 16. And at age 25, I was preaching my first sermon in my first United Methodist congregation. I had my degrees, my probationary credentials. I was ready to rock and roll. I had no real aspirations beyond this, lacking the apparently required male physiology to rise in the clergy ranks. I honestly expected to serve small to mid-sized congregations for 40 years and then retire. My congregants did not know what to make of me. Most of them were very, very senior citizens. And I know they wondered what a young girl like me could possibly offer as their minister. Most of them wanted a personal chaplain, someone to listen to them, to visit them in home and hospital, to preach interesting but not challenging sermons and become immersed in their community. And I did those things. This city girl tried to fit into their one traffic light Alabama town. I shopped at the little grocery store and chatted with the postmistress in her little post office next door. I learned to quilt with the local ladies who met in the back room at the beauty parlor and heard all the latest news in town. One parishioner took me on a tour of his cotton gin and another gave me little bantam eggs to take home whenever I visited his sick wife. I shelled butter beans on the front porch with one lady and yelled myself hoarse visiting another who would never wear her hearing aids. I supported the little old police chief when one of my octogenarian parishioners threatened to shoot him and herself in a moment of crisis. I taught the teen Sunday school class before church every week and I brought a casserole to the first Sunday potluck. I held hands and prayed in hospital waiting rooms. I stood with families in the sacred space by the deathbed and bore witness to the passing of precious human beings from this world. I preached and sang on Sundays, morning and evening. This was what I wanted to be when I grew up. And like most things, it was a mixed experience, sometimes satisfying and sometimes frustrating. I never doubted my calling, not really, but there were plenty of times I wondered what it would be like to do something else with my life. When I entertained those thoughts, I always came to the same conclusion. For me, there was nothing better than parish ministry. I told people I became a minister because I honestly couldn't find anything better to do. We are mothers of courage and fathers of time. We are daughters of dust and the sons of great visions. We're siblings of mercy and kindred of love. We're lovers of life and the builders of nations. We're seekers of truth and the keepers of faith. We are makers of peace and the wisdom of ages. In Isak Denison's account of her years living in Kenya, she recounts an argument with her lover, Dennis Finch Hatton. He declared, I don't want to discover one day that I am at the end of someone else's life. Don't ask me to do that. Ever worried that you might be living someone else's idea of what your life should be like? It took a while for me to realize that what I wanted to be and who I wanted to be were not the same thing. What I had become in my vocation and who I was growing into came along together. But at first it was easy to allow the what to overshadow the who. There was a danger that I did not see early on of living someone else's life or living a life that others prescribed for me. What we do for a living is not who we are. Some of us are extraordinarily lucky to be following a call which gives us a sense of personal satisfaction and purpose. Many do not have that luxury. A dear friend of 30 years is fond of saying work is a four letter word. In his 70s now, I don't think he has ever held a job. He really found satisfying, but he has grown into a beautiful human being nonetheless. 
It is a wonderful and all too rare gift to be able to make a living doing what you love. Many people in this country work only from necessity rather than calling or passion. They force themselves to go to work each day to provide resources necessary for survival, but they do not love what they do. During these pandemic times, many folk are questioning their lives, their work, their choices and opportunities. Of course, not everyone grows up in a family with adequate resources surrounded by love and encouragement. Some young people in this country grow up in homes of neglect and abuse. For them, the answers to what do you want to be are safe, clean, fed, clothed. For these, there are no visions of future careers. They can only dream of getting away. Work is only the necessary grind to put food on the table and keep a roof over the head. There can be no elevation of the spirit when there is degradation of the body and the mind. If any of this applies to anyone here or anyone you know, come and talk to me. Let's see what we can do. We are alive until we die. We grow until we stop. When working with young people, I offer the following precepts when they are pondering that question of what do I want to be? Let your work be honorable. Let your work be useful to the community. Let your work provide adequate compensation to support yourself and your family. Let your work give you some personal satisfaction. These precepts also hold true when considering who you want to be. Let your life and personal practices be honorable. Let your thoughts and deeds be useful. Strive to find and create the emotional resources necessary to support yourself and your family. Let your inner development give you personal satisfaction. We are alive until we die. We grow until we stop. Certainly, we may retire from our jobs and careers and most probably should at some point, but we do not retire from life. Each of us still has much to offer and each still has becoming to do. And don't let physical disability be an excuse to give up learning and growing. I knew an amazing woman named Frankie. She was for years a very competent administrator for a small local company. And in her 50s, she contracted a rare illness and went stone blind in the space of a few weeks. I can only imagine what a terrifying nightmare that was. Frankie couldn't stand the thought of just sitting at home doing nothing. She enrolled in the county trade school where many of the students were high school dropouts and former prison inmates seeking training to start their lives over. They had a few programs taught jointly with the Alabama School for the Deaf and Blind. And Frankie took a class in how to manage vending machines. She learned how to order stock, sort products, open and load the machines, check them for servicing needs. Her husband provided her transportation and assisted her, but she did much of the work herself. It was honorable, useful sufficiently lucrative and personally satisfying. Where did Frankie get such determination? Well, you might get an idea about that if you had ever watched her 85-year-old mother, Miss Frances, mowing her two acres of grass. We are alive until we die. We grow until we stop. He said Barnwell, who wrote the UU hymn that I have been singing, was a leading member of the Black women's a cappella group, Sweet Honey in the Rock. Her beautiful lyrics remind us that each child is a gift, an answer to prayers, an inheritor of wisdom and learning, a product of labor and love. The hymn also points toward what gifts we each bring with us into this life and what we have within to give back to the universe we are born into. For each child that's born, a morning star rises and sings to the universe who we are.
Have you grown up yet? Are you what you want to be? Are you who you want to be? If you are still breathing, there's still time will be coming. Oh, and I taught Liam how to make coffee. He makes good coffee and he's growing into a fine young man. Let's all keep growing and becoming. Amen. Shalom. Blessed be. Cheered by our community by Burton Carly. Cheered by our community, blessed by our covenant, uplifted in mind and renewed in spirit, go forth with courage and in peace to meet the days to come. Amen. When we can truly celebrate the diversity of contributions and talents offered by all people, we shall overcome hatred and prejudice and op oppression. When we can truly extend our hands to one another in loving acceptance, we shall overcome the past that haunts us now. Living in peace and freedom, we shall overcome the wrongs that have happened and the debts unpaid. Let us join together in that commitment to overcome. Let us say together, Amen. <laughs>